In 1994, South Africa inspired the world as millions of people queued patiently to vote in the country's first democratic elections. It was the end of apartheid, the forced division of people by the color of their skin. We, the people of South Africa, said the Freedom Charter of the African National Congress, declare that our country belongs to everyone and that all the people shall share in the wealth. The land shall be shared among those who work it. There shall be houses, security, and the right to work. This is Robben Island off Cape Town, where Nelson Mandela and thousands of political prisoners were banished. It seems the right place to ask why those freedoms, for which so many fought and died, are still missing in South Africa. Yes, apartheid based on race is outlawed now, but the system always went far deeper than that. The cruelty and injustice were underwritten by an economic apartheid, which regarded people as no more than cheap, expendable labor. It was backed by great business corporations in South Africa, Britain, the rest of Europe and the United States. And it was this apartheid based on money and profit that allowed a small minority to control most of the land, most of the industrial wealth, and most of the economic power. Today, the same system is called, without a trace of irony, the free market. This film will ask why apartheid continues by other means. I was banned by the apartheid government 30 years ago, and this is my first trip back. Robben Island was my starting point, and my guide was a former ANC resistance fighter, Ahmed Kathrada, known as Kathy, who spent 18 years in this prison. Uh, this here was the president's cell. So this, uh, this was Nelson Mandela's cell. That's right. Mm -hmm. How long did he spend in there? Now, he did not move much. So I should say that of the 18 years that he spent on Robben Island, mm. the bulk of those years were, were here. What was in the cell when we first came was a sisal mat and three blankets. And after a, a while, they, they gave us the felt mat as well. How many years did you have just that? We slept on the ground for the about 14 of the 18 years that we spent on Robben Island. And I was the only non-African among the seven of us here. So when we had to change into prison clothes, uh, I was given the regulation uh, shirt, jersey, canvas jacket, long trousers, socks, shoes. My colleagues were given short trousers. Mm. But there's a rationale behind why they were given short trousers. In South Africa, and unfortunately even now, Africans are still regarded as children. You find terminology in our homes, in white homes in particular, you talk of your garden boy, your kitchen girl. Regardless of age, boys wear short trousers. So Mandela had to wear short trousers. Unfortunately, our white uh, compatriots have not been generous enough to recognize that when President Mandela talks of reconciliation and forgiveness, they have forgotten or refused to see what it is he has forgiven. This was the crime of apartheid. Deliberately and systematically, People were dispossessed of their land and their rights and the essentials of life. Tens of thousands of children died when their families were wrenched apart. Today, behind the modern face of democracy, 87% of all African children suffer poor health. A quarter of children under the age of six suffer chronic malnutrition. 
Yet time and again, the African people found the spirit to rise up. In 1976, in Soweto, hundreds of schoolchildren confronted white police who opened fire on them. It was the children's action and courage that led to international sanctions. By the 1980s, a general uprising had begun. The apartheid regime began to panic. White privilege that amounted to one of the highest standards of living on Earth was clearly at risk. F.W. de Klerk, a so-called moderate, became president and in 1990 made this historic announcement. The prohibition of the African National Congress, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the South African Communist Party and a number of subsidiary organizations is being rescinded. De Klerk's strategy was to seize the initiative and co-opt the ANC leadership. The white establishment and its backers in Washington and London wanted above all to maintain power over the economy and to keep South Africa safe for international capital regardless of the color of its government. Behind these very public meetings, the ANC met secretly with the regime. A special relationship developed in which accommodating the demands of the old apartheid order began to take precedence over the spirit of the Freedom Charter. Nelson Mandela had promised his people that an ANC government would take over apartheid's great collaborators, the mining companies and the financial institutions. He said, it is inconceivable that we will ever change this fundamental policy. But this promise was already broken as the ANC agreed to what it called historic compromises. Klerk saw the writing on the wall, and he knew the, the economy was on the point of collapse. So he was negotiating for weakness as well. But if you'd pressed him for another year or two, he'd have been totally weak. There'd, there'd, there'd be nothing he could do. The ANC has always maintained that had it not made these compromises, there would have been a bloodbath. No, they were very serious compromises. There, there might have been, I don't think necessarily a bloodbath. A lot, a lot of people might have died. But a lot of people have died since 1994 anyway, um, and probably more have died since then. Not only through the, the violence, which is a tip of the iceberg of people dying, but people have continued to die in vast numbers from malnutrition and uh, preventable illness. Out of these deals with the regime grew the ANC's policy of reconciliation. But reconciliation for whom? Who would make the sacrifices? How was it possible for the victims of a form of genocide to reconcile with their oppressors. One of the deals was amnesty for the killers, torturers and collaborators. All they had to do was take part in a truth and reconciliation commission, a kind of public confessional in which they didn't have to say sorry and there was no justice and people got away literally with murder. By broadcasting its evidence on national radio and television, the Truth Commission's great achievement has been to give white South Africans the opportunity to come to terms with the horrors of the crimes committed in their name. No one can now say, I didn't know. We invite Charity Kondili to the stand, please. Thousands of cases will never get justice in a court of law. Mrs. Charity Condili does not want reconciliation. She wants the kidnappers and murderers of her son, Sizwe, to stand trial. And this is one of the self-confessed murderers, Dirk Kotsia, formerly of the South African Security Police. For nine years, we didn't know what had happened to Sizwe. It was such a tough time for the family. It was really haunting. You know, it's, sad, it's very difficult to accept a situation where you don't know what happened to a child. 
So when we eventually knew what had happened to him, I think we, we were relieved, though we were very much sad. One of Major Archie Flemington's men, a sergeant or a warrant, a slender built, tallish man, light hair, took a mucker of pistol with a silencer on, and whilst he was lying, Mr. Condili was lying on his back, shot him on top of the head. There was a short jerk, and that was it. Well, Dirk Kuzia further goes on to say that when he died, they put his body on a pile of wood with the tire, and near the Komatipot River at night, where it took them nine hours to burn his body. And Dirk Kuzia further says that whilst they were burning his body, the flesh was smelling good and they were having beers at that time. So it was like a bride to them, according to their cousin. And as a mother, I feel that no matter whether it was politics fighting for the land, no matter who, I don't think he deserved all that uh, treatment. I feel it was grossly inhuman. I feel if they could have killed him and gave us the body or left it in the felt there, I feel that this was tantamount to cannibalism or even satanism. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once this is a popular TV show called People of the South. Its celebrity guest is Dirk Kotsia, introduced by the host as the Honourable Assassin. The Honourable Assassin, Dirk Kotsia. Welcome, welcome to people of the South. Thank you very much. Thank you for the honor of being on your show. I appreciate it. Our honor entirely. What, um, what would you say, uh, as a young man, if anything, pointed you towards the direction of uh, the police force? Was it, was, was it as a young man that you thought, mm, I want to be a copper? I want to be a copper. Adventure, usually adventure that mm. turns one to... An adventurous life indeed. Kurtzir is asking for amnesty for his part in the murder of six people. In a way, yeah. in the old regime. I feel that if the Truth Commission is going to recommend amnesty for the murderers and uh, people who violated human rights, if those uh, murderers could be punished somehow, that would be justice as far as I'm concerned. In other words, come before a court of law? Yes, and be sentenced. They're looking at what one individual did to another individual. But apartheid was not about what one individual did to another individual. It's what about a whole system did to a whole nation of people. And that has not been put on trial at the Truth Commission. So therefore, you can't reconcile um, the nation when you haven't actually even looked at what happened and why it happened. There's, there's been no real examination of why apart apartheid happened and how it could happen, how you could get that whole system maintained by basically ordinary people your reconciliation has been at the heart of your, your uh, policies. Do you sometimes reflect on the fact that there really isn't a single leading figure in the, the old power structure, uh, the military, uh, business and others, that have shown really any public remorse for what happened during the apartheid regime? I think that is going too far. You have... Uh the Dutch Reformed Church, which was publicly commented by Archbishop Tutu, that apologized for apartheid. You have individuals like Leon Vessels, uh, Rolf Meyer, who were members of the cabinet, who have apologized generally. What, of course, the public wants is that uh, somebody must be able to say we authorized uh, people, mm. our men, to kill so-and-so. That is not forthcoming, but the general apology has been made. I think that uh, it's a great deal of concern that people like de Klerk have tried to, to avoid the responsibility I think it's a great deal, it's a tragedy. And, uh, and once, of course, he took that line, 
Many of his colleagues, you see, also took that line. Not one military general has applied for amnesty, and not a single judge has come forward. Yet it was the judiciary that gave apartheid a veneer of respectability. Today, many of the same judges are administering the law in the new South Africa. Reconciliation is not going to a, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and uh, publicly apologizing for your sins. It's, it's actually the government introducing measures which will redistribute wealth from those who benefited under apartheid to those who suffered under apartheid. Now, now that to us would have been what true conciliation is all about. And the failure to do that, I think, has made the whole reconciliation process a, a bit of a farce. This is Santon Municipality in Johannesburg. Here, in fortified splendor, live some of the richest people in the world. Representing 5% of the population, they and the rest of white South Africa control 88% of the national wealth. And yet they, not the majority, are the material beneficiaries of democracy. No longer international pariahs, they can now travel and play sport and do business wherever in the world they like, secure in the delusion that they gave freedom to the majority. They've been asked to give up nothing, not even a modest wealth tax. Crime is the issue behind the razor wire and the alarm systems, not the great crime of apartheid that destroyed millions of lives and stole the nation's wealth. There is a lot of property crime, but it's also the code for the encroachment of the unemployed across the old dividing lines between black and white. What is remarkable is the degree of restraint exercised by the impoverished majority, given the continuing display of wealth by a minority and the adaptation of many of the injustices of the past. This is Alexandra, literally across the road from wealthy Santon, a community of half a million people squeezed into an area of less than a square mile and a half where the majority have no jobs and up to 15 families live in one slum. And although they drive past it, many whites hardly know it exists. How long will people accept the conditions they're living in here? I think already there are signs of uh, disillusionment and, uh, in a way, resentment, you know, beginning to show uh, in, in, in the township. It's not only Alexandra, I think other townships as well. So if nothing happens between, you know, now and 99, I think most people will begin to say, why should I vote? What change does it make? And to me, uh, in order for reconciliation to be meaningful, I think uh, we have to talk about transforming society fundamentally so that, you know, black people don't feel like we are once more sacrificing. We sacrificed under apartheid, and again, we are sacrificing unemployment within a place like Alexandra, for example, as I said, 60%. Now, those people will continue to resent their white you know, counterparts as long as you know, these disparities continue to exist. If President Mandela, for instance, goes to the Congress of uh, the trade unions, yeah. then he would emphasize the fact that people should tighten their belts. I think the, 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 the answer to that is people have been, the, their belts have been tightened, you know, since time immemorial. Can I tell you about the dress? It's actually, it's, it's on a very fine, transparent mesh that you can wear with or without the lining. I was nominated best dressed woman of South Africa, and I'm you know, people wait to see what I'm wearing because there's always something different. <laughs> it's never quite the same. You don't have one of those sort of Melda Marcos wardrobes where yes, she I do. had all the shoes. She yes, I do. Dresses, so. I have all the dresses and the shoes. Oh, really? I have the whole lot. Oh, Another world record is yeah. gone. Well, you, you, you don't get to have the one without the other. Yeah. You've got to have, you have, have to, it. Yeah. It's the kind of new it's South very, Africa yeah. as a dress, really, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think that people, white people, 
actually know how black people live now? Do they go to those places? Those I, th old, I think know. there's a, a far greater awareness now, mm. definitely. Yeah. I would say we know, but and we don't go. We, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you're crazy. Um, but, you know, now <laughs> with, 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 with the, the abolishment of apartheid, yeah. you find a lot of black people who can afford it have now moved into the so-called white areas, yeah. which is fabulous for them. The jewellery yeah. she's wearing is worth more than 100,000 pounds. <laughs> Half the African people of South Africa have an income of less than 12 pounds a week. I must say, a bit difficult to find somebody who supported apartheid. Mm. These days, oh, well, everyone seems no, no, to be no, against yeah, everyone it. Now, <laughs> everyone now, because yeah, nobody wants yeah. to, yeah. Mm. No, we were all there. We were all there. Um, mm. And a lot of people supported it at the time. Yeah. Like I say, I didn't. I always felt uncomfortable. And I don't think anyone's now going to say how great apartheid was, so you're going to have to mm. search really hard. You're going to look to under every one. bed and under every bush yeah. and every rock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is the memorial to Cecil Rhodes overlooking Cape Town. It's extraordinary it's still here. Long before the Boers declared racism official policy in South Africa, Rhodes had laid the foundations for a more durable form of apartheid. I prefer land to niggers, said Rhodes, who was until recently the idol of English liberalism in Africa. As Prime Minister of the Cape in the late 19th century, Rhodes showed how liberal he was. He drove much of the black population into reserves where they were used as cheap, dependent labor. Above all, he was a businessman of the most rapacious kind. And the system he and British business helped to build in Southern Africa would soon produce an undreamed of balance sheet. The South African gold mining industry during the 60s and the 70s was one of the most profitable industries in the world. It was hugely profitable. It made millions. Um, the profits made on a single worker um, were unmatched, unparalleled in industry or in mining anywhere else in the world. Democracy has made little difference to the lives of the 70,000 miners who work here on the gold fields at Carltonville. The local miners' union representative, Franz Bellini, makes his daily calls to find out how many men were killed or injured overnight. Last night there was no fatal accident, save for Friday, where two people were killed. And yesterday there was a local inspection where the inspector of mines went underground to actually see the scene of the accident. Is that uh, a common kind of accident? Well, I think it's negligence because when a shaft is being cleared, um, nothing should be uh, happening above them in the shaft. Mm. So for rocks to have fallen in the shaft, it's a clear uh, man negligence. Since mining began in South Africa, 69,000 men have been killed in accidents. It's been estimated that the human cost of every ton of gold mined is one life and 12 serious injuries. Those are statistics that are of great concern. What we have always said is uh, South African mining, gold mining in particular, is the deepest mining in the world. All mining has risk. South African mining has the most risk. There is no such thing as risk-free mining. What one has to do is to mitigate the risk. And that requires a number of interactions, technical interactions, human interactions. And I think as we would gladly accept now, those require cooperative management employee interactions, which may not perhaps have always been there to the degree that was desired. You, you may be aware of the, um, the business report study, um, which was taken from safety data of the Chamber of Mines. That's it. Um, it says that... Um, 
that in 1995 Anglo-American had the highest gold mining fatality rate uh, of all the major mining houses, even if you excluded the 104 men killed in the Vives accident of that year. Um, unfortunately, there is no response from the company in that. What would your response be to that? Highly regrettable, but perhaps one would have had a headline in 1994, that would have been different. 1993, that would have been different. What, what was the situation you, then? Anglo-American did not have the highest and some other company had the highest. After all, there has to be one that has the highest every year. To uh, the lay eye, and you say these figures are regrettable, uh, they're shocking figures. The uh, government mining engineer, uh, Mr. Backer, said in almost every accident, he's talking about the whole industry, not just your company, one can find underlying causes. There is a lack of management system, supervision, training and negligence, and a lax enforcement of standards. And you say it's just mining. Uh, is this man got, is he, is he, he has it all wrong? Is that it? No, I think that that's certainly part of a much broader issue. This man is the government mining engineer. He says that in every accident there are underlying causes and they have to do with negligence. What's the company's response to that? If it isn't a selective quote, what's the company's response? I've given you my response, John, what is it uh, again? To, Sorry, to, to the entire uh, subject. I've given you in general terms, mm -hmm. and I think that's what I have to say at the moment. <clears throat> the most devastating cost to these men remains hidden. A third of all black miners have succumbed to deadly lung disease with little compensation. This continues today. If you take into account that there have been perhaps two million mine workers who've passed through the mines just in the last 10 years, and um, over the last 100 or so, many, many millions, and if 20 or 30 percent of all those contracted these diseases, um, a great many people have died in southern Africa. Cough, cough, cough. <coughs> <coughs> I think that what's been done around dust is appalling. There is no research, the statistics are hidden, there is very little work being done on reducing dust in the workplace, and I say this on the basis of practical exposure to the mining industry and a, a long involvement in health and safety on the mines. Dust is ignored, it's neglected. It doesn't kill people like a rock fall does. It's an insidious, slow killer. It's killing people far away. It's killing them quietly. They just, their clockwork's running down, their batteries are drying up, and they're dying. It's not getting the attention it deserves. Why? Because the people who are dying are so far away. The people who are dying are out in the country. The people who are dying but aren't not important people. They're not important people? Not in the South African context. What do you mean? They're rural people. They're poor people. They're people without a voice. They're people who are inarticulate. They're people on the fringes. They're, they're working class people. In neighboring countries, in our most remote rural areas, these are the people who have no voice, they have no say, they have no influence. They simply die quietly. What has changed under democracy? Well, the references to race and unequal treatment in terms of the amount of compensation people are entitled to, those have been removed from the act. But the bottom line is the same is black mine workers are getting sick on the mines and they're going home, they're being left untreated, impoverished, and they're dying. Um, nothing has changed at all. Some of the research that is recently being done in this country suggests that a third of all miners are suffering some form of quite serious uh, disease as a result of their uh, occupational disease. Yep. But well, they come away with yep. very little. That's, that's the point. Certainly levels of compensation have changed and are changing further. How are they changing? The amounts have been increased. By, uh, by what? What, what? Can you give me an example? I'd, I'd, I'd have to give you a, a rough estimate, but certainly compared to the 1970s, there are multiples of the levels there.
Can't you give me an example of a, of a miner over a period of time? I mean, you, you know, this is your field, really, uh, and what he would have got and what he now gets. I don't have the figures, John, no. I, I regret that. I'm don't you find that extraordinary for the public affairs manager of this company? I asked you about a simple question to give an I example find, of the compensation. Now, wait, this I is about I to do with mining, I and don't you, you don't have the information. I don't find that extraordinary at all. Before the electronic revolution, this was the trading floor of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. What has not changed is the fact that just five huge companies control almost three quarters of all listed shares here. Known as the Royal Balcony, they represent one of the greatest concentrations of corporate wealth and power on earth. A power that underwrote apartheid in a manner reminiscent of the great German companies that ran the economy of the Third Reich. They're dominated by the Anglo-American Corporation, whose interests reach into every corner of South African life, from minerals to tourism, property to retailing. What's good for Anglo-American, it's often said here, is good for South Africa. In 1960, the South African police murdered 69 peaceful demonstrators at the town of Sharpville. This atrocity was a clear sign to Western business that the population was being disciplined and opposition crushed. Foreign capital poured in, most of it from Britain. Indeed, Britain was the biggest single investor in South Africa, followed by the Americans, who saw their capital return higher profits than anywhere else in the world. The ANC's most important historic compromise was to reinforce the economic power of these pillars of apartheid. The ideals of the Freedom Charter were replaced by a policy favoring big business and the free market. Apartheid's chief economic manager, Chris Stiles, governor of the Reserve Bank under the old regime, kept his job. The former economic system, he said, had served the country well. Under democracy, foreign investment has tripled, profits have risen, and jobs have disappeared at the rate of 100,000 a year. Those multinational companies that continued doing business with the apartheid regime, Coca-Cola, Siemens, BMW, Shell, and Mercedes-Benz, are prospering. We are seeking to establish said Trevor Manuel, the finance minister, an environment in which winners flourish. You must remember that uh, the best way uh, to introduce transformation is to do so without uh, dislocating any aspect of our public life. And uh, we do not want to challenge uh, big business in a way where they can take fright and take out away their monies. We are changing the whole economic aspect of this country, but it has to be done skillfully by discussions with stakeholders and where we are unable to agree to push on. Do you um, reflect that the the Freedom Charter, and para paraphrasing, did say or did aspire to the people of this country really owning its wealth. Is that something that's still possible? Why not? They are already beginning to share in that wealth. Uh, the affirmative action as far as business is concerned, you are having now uh, blacks, Africans, Colors, and Indians uh, involved in companies which command the billions of assets. Something totally new in the history of this country. Uh, that is 
taking a share in the wealth of that country. Since the ANC came to power, inequality among blacks has risen as the class gap has opened up. People power is being taken over by a black elite, an extension of the black middle class created by the apartheid regime as a buffer to real change. This is Cyril Ramaphosa, former head of the Miners Union and today a member of the ANC's national executive and a millionaire businessman, seen here with mining magnate Nicky Oppenheimer. It was Ramaphosa who negotiated the ANC's historic compromises. By using black faces in the boardroom, the old power structure has gained access to the new political establishment. In terms of South Africa's policies towards the rest of the world, I read that in Bangkok this year you said we are willing to deal with any region irrespective of the internal policies of any country. Is that, is that correct? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, what would have happened to South Africa, though, if that, if that had been applied to the ANC uh, during the struggle, uh, if that attitude of tolerance had been applied, surely um, apartheid might have lasted longer than it did. Uh, there's a, a real fundamental difference with apartheid. There is no country anywhere in the world where discrimination and oppression is part of the legal system. The real resentment of the world and why South Africa was regarded as, an e uh, as uh, enforcing an evil system is the fact that racism was entrenched in the constitution of the country and in its laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, some of the Western countries are lagging behind countries like in the Middle East, where in a country like Saudi Arabia, students enjoy benefits I have not seen anywhere in the world, where students study free and in university they are actually paid no less than $300 a month for studying free. You don't find a thing like that in the West. Perhaps the price that's paid, though, is uh, Saudi Arabia's appalling human rights record. So. What does human rights record mean? Does poverty of a large section of the people, disease, ignorance, medical services that they cannot afford, is not that part of a bad human rights record? President Suharto has demonstrated... That's the same argument put forward by the Indonesian dictator, General Suharto, whose regime is responsible for the deaths of 200,000 people in East Timor. Suharto has given large amounts of money to the ANC, and President Mandela has given him South Africa's highest honor. <laughs> the forced removal of millions of people from the land was the most brutal weapon of South Africa's white rulers. Today, wealthy white farmers continue to control more than 80% of the agricultural land and their existing property rights are guaranteed in the new constitution. We have set up a claims court which is busy examining, investigating uh, firstly, uh, whether people can be given land from state land. And we're make, making pro progress as far as that is concerned. Secondly, there were people who were removed from their own land by force. And where those people can be returned to that land, we are returning them. In fact, less than half of 1% of farming land has been given back. I think it's fear, basically. They're frightened, you know, just as the old government was frightened to upset white farmers, um, this new government is almost as frightened. And I don't know why there, there are less than 60,000 white farmers, that's all, who own all this land. It's not the whole population of four or five million whites. Most of them, for example, are, their land is mortgaged to the land bank, which is basically the government. The government really owns most of their land. 
that they're in debt to the, to the land bank for 23 billion rand. Um, and if the government simply foreclosed on those loans, they would have the land back. Then they say, oh, we can't do that because we rely on these people to produce. We don't. The vast majority of those farmers are hardly productive at all. Most of our agriculture is produced, or produce, comes from 3% of the arable land. Now that 3% is owned by a tiny group of extremely wealthy white farmers. The unbreakable promise of the ANC's 1994 election campaign was the Reconstruction and Development Program known as RDP. It was this that would bring to the people of South Africa the basics of a decent life so long denied them by apartheid, water, housing, electricity, education, health care and land. In the words of the Freedom Charter, it would be the restoration of dignity. Two years after the election, the RDP office was closed down as the ANC adopted a conservative economic program known unofficially as cautious Thatcherism. Today, almost a quarter of the national budget pays the interest on a huge debt left by the apartheid regime. This means that the people must pay for their oppression twice over. It was the great hope of people that scenes like this would never happen again. This is 1997, and these homeless people are being evicted from public land. ANC housing policy relies largely on private banks, which are reluctant to lend to poor people. The very poorest may get a grant of 2,000 pounds to build this. Outside walls are extra. This is the sales brochure for a mock Tudor house in Constantia in Cape Town. It's selling for two and a half million pounds. So really, I mean, business has looked up and the property market yes. has looked up since, since the ANC government came in. Yes, it? yes, it, it certainly has. And I think that, that because of the uh, people look to this uh, country, as being a country with a future yeah. and forgetting about the baggage of the past. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities here. Uh, but has, has lifestyle changed uh, at all? I don't think, no. I don't think that there, there are many changes yeah. at all um, other than, as I say, a change of attitude. Yeah. There is a definite change of attitude. Now I understand you sold Mark Thatcher his house. Could, could you tell me something about that? He bought a very beautiful house in mm. Upper Constantia. A lot of character, beautiful views, mm. exquisite garden, mm. and lovely reception rooms. It's got a lovely, it really has mm. a lovely atmosphere. In a way, it's a sort of, has a bit of an African flavor. And I know that um, Baroness Thatcher liked the house. She was there and admired the views and thought it was, it was a lovely home for her, for her son and for her grandchildren. She's a great friend of South Africa. She's been she supportive over she the is. years. Yeah. She's fantastic. More than a million people have been given access to running water. It's one of the government's success stories. Yet up to 14 million still have no reliable water supply. While whites continue to irrigate their gardens and fill their swimming pools, women like these walk half a mile carrying water that is often polluted. These homeless women near Cape Town are building their own houses, having raised the money themselves, proving that given the resources, people will do the job. They are a symbol of what is possible. We are going to change the South Africa. The people will change South Africa. Yes. Now it's better to, to do ourselves. That's why we said it's our dreams. One week to build a house of this yes. size. It was one week and because there were members who helped me yeah. to build this house. Yeah. How, many, how many women were working on it in that week? It was 25 women. 
How did they learn how to build a house? They have learned a lot. Because the others, when the time they were getting, they were getting themselves involved in this project, they do not know nothing about building a house, about measuring the size of the plot. So when they get in the project, they learn a lot yeah. how to build a house, how to divide the rooms. You must feel very proud of it. Yes, I do feel very proud because in my life, I didn't know that I could have a house like this because before I was living in a shack. So this is a new life, completely new life. This is a new life for me and for my husband and for my children also. The first time I flushed my toilet, I was frightened. I'm afraid because I didn't ever have a toilet inside my house. <laughs> One of the outstanding achievements of the new South Africa has come from the Ministry of Health, led by a courageous woman, Dr. Nkozazana Zuma. The rule of apartheid left 87% of black children in poor health, many of them malnourished and stunted. There is now free health care for pregnant women and children under six. Mm -hmm. Clinics have been built where there was none, and millions of children have been immunized against rampant diseases like polio. Last year, abortion was legalized, and in the first six months of the new law, 13,000 women did not die, nor were they subjected to the indignity and pain of backstreet abortion, which was a unique feature of life and death under apartheid. A humane society, said the minister, does not happen as a miracle. This is Dimbaza, the secret heart of the old and new South Africa. In places like this, a million people were dumped by the white regime. When the trucks brought the first people here to a windswept hillside without water, the children were the first to die. And here lie 500 of them. We are housing redundant people in Dimbaza said a government official, people who cannot render productive service. Today, the people here are redundant yet again. It's ironic that the children's graveyard is now an industrial graveyard, as foreign-owned factories built by the apartheid state as a showcase have mostly closed down leaving 70% unemployed. One factory still working makes T-shirts for designer labels sold in the West. It overlooks the children's graveyard. A reminder of the price paid by the most vulnerable South Africans on their long journey to a place in the global economy. Coming back to South Africa, I've been surprised to discover a generosity of spirit that survived the atrocities of apartheid. It's a humanism expressed in a distinctly African notion that people are people through other people. The sense of community and sharing is not without the usual frailties, but the evidence of its resilience is everywhere in this country, and this film has been a tribute to that vibrant quality. But tributes are not enough. Did people vote to exchange apartheid for a democracy of privilege and poverty? Did all that celebration take place so that the new South Africa might be slotted into a predetermined economic system a global apartheid whose only certainty is that the rich get richer and the poor poorer. Nelson Mandela himself has said, how many times have the liberators betrayed the ordinary people at the moment of victory? If the ANC does not deliver the goods, the people must do to it what they have done to the apartheid regime. 
It was the ordinary people of South Africa who set the pace of change. It was their humanity and their courage that triumphed here, proving that fundamental change is possible. It will be a tragedy for all of us if their continuing struggle goes unrewarded, for its inspiration and lessons are universal.